Dr. Riddell will present on the two-way dual language program. Madam President, um, school board and Dr. Riddell, um, we have a presentation that we will show you. Um, it does kind of flesh out and give you an opportunity to take a look at um, the two-way dual lang language program. Um, as it's being currently implemented, it's one-way dual language. Uh, we'll talk with you for just a few moments about that success and then um, talk with you about what we hope to be able to uh, do this coming year so that we can expand this to two-way dual language. So Dr. Leslie Lewis and Mr. Pena and Mrs. Hall are here with us and they're going to be visiting with you about this. Dr. Waddell and school board members, it's an honor to be here this evening to present you with an update on our dual language program that we have currently in the district. Um, I'll be speaking a little bit to the program model and the structure, and then my colleagues will talk a little bit more about um, their particular campuses where the program exists. We um, have a program goal in dual language to develop fully bilingual and biliterate students by the end of fifth grade so that they can um, participate and a competent level in advanced academic courses at the secondary level. Currently our program model structure is a co-teach model. We have two teachers that partner with each other. One of them is bilingual certified and one of them is ESL certified. They um, instruct the students in both languages for 50% of the time that they're in school. So it's a 50-50 one may dual language um, program. Currently, the program only serves native Spanish speakers. That's why it's a one-way program. A two-way program incorporates native English speakers. We, in our district, exclusively serve right now the Spanish-speaking students as part of our state compliance model. The languages of instruction are strictly separated, and so the students rotate between the classrooms. They have an English teacher and they have a Spanish teacher. We use the LISD district curriculum, and the grade levels are added incrementally each year beginning in kindergarten. So we have currently K through three implementation and we're going to be excited to report to you the performance this year on the tax test. We are currently planning for a fourth grade implementation next year at three of our campuses and then in the next year, in 2012-2013, we will have a K through five implementation at three of our elementary schools. Um, currently, we have three elementary schools that participate. We've got Mr. Pena at Central Elementary, we have Ms. Hall at Peters Colony, and Ms. Winslow at Independence, who is not with us this evening. So it's my honor to turn the presentation to Mr. Pena to further discuss us in the beginning. Well, good evening, uh, Dr. Waddell, esteemed uh, presidents and board members. Uh, it's with great pleasure that uh, we sit here and, and share with you some of the current data for dual language. Uh, this is my fourth year as principal at Central Elementary School and uh, started the pilot program back in 2007 uh, with the need to uh, improve scores and academic achievement at the school. But we started off with two bilingual classrooms in kindergarten and now they have uh, completed their third grade at Central Elementary School. We started off with 40 bilingual students at the time uh, subsequently after that we had the construction of Independence Elementary School where we lost five students to and we had the construction also of Louisville Elementary School uh, where we lost three students to Louisville so through attrition of some of the students and moving and transitioning we uh, served uh, 20 students out of the 40 to provide you with some information of the participants that started in the original cohort in 2007 it's been a pleasure to see those students grow from kinder all the way to third grade. And uh, the dual language student cohort data has come in and it is with a great excitement that I share with you. Their scores in the area of reading for the cohort students was 90% meeting standard for tax and reading and 35% were commended. That is a great celebration for us and for the boys and girls of Central. Also in the area of math, we have 80% who met standard and 25% were commended. Uh, those levels are outstanding uh, performance for our boys and girls. We also have independence data uh, of the five students. They have 80% met standard in reading and 20% commended in reading. In the 
area of math, 80% met standard and 20% were commended. Uh, I also was previously a dual language teacher and uh, it's just an exciting program where students are able to learn. Uh, the rigor is, is unexplainable. The teachers this year, as they got those students, they were like, these kids are different. The confidence is not able to be placed on paper. Their ability to speak more than one language uh, builds that confidence and, and the ability to seek more knowledge. So they're hungry for knowledge. You can hear them conversing in the hallways. They just have a different attitude towards life. And, and being bilingual will open up a lot of doors for them. I will take any questions about the, the dual language program that you might have, uh, specifically at Central, if you have any questions. I, I have some. Will we have to hire new teachers or additional teachers? And if so, how many, what's the cost? That's a, that, at Central, the way it worked, 2007, nothing, nothing was an additional cost. Actually, it was a savings to the district. Uh, because we had to hire less bilingual teachers. Uh, therefore, as we hired uh, more ESL teachers to complement and make the program work through the process of attrition, as teachers left for whatever reason, then we were able to switch those units from bilingual to ESL and balance out the program. So there was no additional cost. You, you know, we have a, a, a critical need for bilingual teachers in Texas, so it's very difficult many times to recruit teachers into um, they don't want to leave their homes, and so in South Texas, they have an abundance of bilingual teachers, and we don't have that necessarily here in the Metroplex. So there's always a shortage for recruiting of bilingual teachers. This model allowed us to stabilize the bilingual teachers that we had and serve an ever-increasing student population at the same time. So we were able to save money in that we didn't have to recruit bilingual teachers in, and we were able to actually um, teach in a, in a good instructional model for those students that we had and the numbers were increasing. And part of how that happens, Mrs. Latham, is that whereas in years gone by we would have had two bilingual teachers for two classes, and in this program model we had a bilingual teacher and an ESL certified teacher, and the children travel back and forth between the teachers, so one day they're speaking Spanish with the Spanish speaking teacher, and the next day they're speaking English with the ESL certified teacher. So there's no additional personnel. Well, that that brings me to another question that I had. What is the difference between dual language and two language? The um, the uh, dual language program there's it's one kind of umbrella term for two different types of programs based on the student populations in them. A one-way program is what Dr. Riddell described, which is a partnered ESL and a bilingual teacher. All of their students are native Spanish speakers. Those are one-way programs, dual language programs. Two-way programs are still the same thing. You have an English speaking teacher and a bilingual teacher, but half of the students are native English speakers. They can elect to participate in the program, and the other half are native Spanish speakers who are participating for our state compliance model. So two-way means that you've got native speakers integrated with native Spanish speakers, one way means everybody's a native Spanish speaker. Currently, we have just the one way. Um, as we continue in the presentation, we don't want to leave out Ms. Hall. Um, we expanded in 2008 and 2009 to Peter's Colony and Independence. Independence opened that year and wanted to also implement um, a one-way dual language program, as did Ms. Hall. So they implemented a first and a kindergarten unit at the same time. We think of our original cohort of kids as ones that have been instructed in the K through three model beginning in 2007. So we're tracking longitudinally their performance because we can get a good gauge of how a student will perform given that type of instructional program model. Um, we currently right now in the two-way, uh, for the two-way program are in the planning and preparation stage. We, um, using the same structure, hopefully we'll be able to open it up to our communities and we'll be um, providing the opportunity for native English speakers if they choose so to participate to enroll in into the dual language program. So we don't, so we don't have the two-way 
language program anywhere today. We only have the dual language, which is just the one way. It's, we do have a few exceptions. We accommodate teacher requests on campuses. Mr. Pena had teachers that worked on his campus that wanted their personal children enrolled in the program, and we accommodated those requests. Otherwise than that, we don't have an official two-way program yet. It's pretty much everything that you've already stated, but you know we talked about you. We did see just an incredible increase in the children's ability to read, and that's measured with their DRA and EDL. And when they came into first grade after and second grade after having participated in the dual language program, it was a phenomenal increase in their ability to read. And we all know that literacy is the primary component in learning from grade school a lot. The more they read, the better they do in school. Also, I wanted to say that there's a sense of pride that these children didn't have before. A lot of times you would see their head down. They didn't They didn't make eye contact. And now they're, pri they're so prideful. We can speak two languages. We're in a special program. They have peers that want to be in their program. So I just think that's just as important as them learning because they're, they're eager to be at school and they're excited about learning. And our third grade tax scores that came through this year with our bilingual students are higher than they've ever been. We did use, you know, before we had the opportunity to take it three times before that was no longer a compliance need, but this year they were higher and our committed rates were higher than they've ever been with their following the students. Uh, to add to Ms. Hall's comment about the diagnostic reading assessments in, in English and Spanish, all of our third graders at Central are at or above grade level in both English and Spanish. And that's an incredible feat uh, for those teachers and students. And, uh, you know, Ms. Kyer and Ms. Gregg and some of the other board members have been in, I think they've seen what, what we're discussing on paper and to see the faces on those children and that sense of confidence is, is just truly unbelievable. We, we were talking about the students that made the choice to come through this year and I have two uh, kindergarten students and they're for my fifth grade teachers. They came in speaking no Spanish at all. Now they're fluent Spanish readers. They love to speak Spanish. They choose to um, communicate in Spanish on the playground. I like the mother. mother said that they hear the Spanish being spoken in the uh, um, when they're shopping and they translate for them. These are children that do not know Spanish words at all and they're just not even in first grade yet. It's, it's amazing to watch. We'll spend the next school year working with the uh, remaining bilingual campuses to um, implement the dual language model so that we can have the same type of results on all campuses so the students that uh, move around between schools can move into the same program when they move from school to school. And so um, I have to say also, too, it's also a real honor to work with these two administrators at the table. They are phenomenal principals, very supportive, and they have the students' best interests at heart. So uh, kudos to them because the scores are reflected in the support that they provide for the teachers. And I would like to add that there's, um, it, it's not magic that the um, dual language program alone creates the kind of learning that happens. The magic is when the teachers get together and they plan. Because in, in the case where a student would go to English on day one, Spanish on day two, English on day three, and so on, the teachers have collaborated using the curriculum, using the standards that the students have to know, understand, and be able to do. So that in day one, the child goes and hears the lesson in Spanish, and in day two, the English-speaking teacher says, and as we were saying yesterday in Spanish, and the lesson continues, there is no lost time. Time is accelerated for students because there's um, no time when the teacher feels like he or she is backtracking over the prior day's lesson. Just one quick question. When we get the two-way program up and running, will there be a consideration for uh, kids who may be English speakers that want to get into the Spanish program, but maybe it's not at their school, how we can get them involved or offer that to them? 
I'm thinking that there will be, yes, sir. Will it involve transportation or? No. <laughs> <laughs> But, but what I think is going to happen is there's going to be a demand for this across the district and it'll become viral. Uh, people, people are going to want to, uh, you know, we have a transfer policy that people can apply to, but that's not going to be adequate after a while. I think we're going to see pressure, which I think is good pressure, uh, to, uh, to expand this so their kids can speak two languages. It's been a weakness of the American education system that we're the one nation in the civilized world that children don't learn to speak multiple languages. It's, I, it, for me in my career, it's always been something that I've, I've not felt good about. We've never been able to solve the problem. Um, it's one we need to get over. You know, part of it's been the lack of capacity in terms of, as, as Ms. Latham brought out, you know, available teachers. But, we have that ability to do that here in the school district. We're very fortunate. Um, so I think it's going to be really one of the great things in the future that we're going to be able to do in the school district. But I think there's going to be pressure on that, Mr. Nam. That's good news because I've wanted that for so long and have been pushing because I feel that we should be bilingual. Uh, in El Paso, when my children were young, they were very fortunate to have had to have. Uh, from K through 6, they had no choice. And then 7th and 8th, they could elect to take it if they wanted to. So when my daughter competed in a uh, speech debate in Spanish, every judge wrote on her critique. They could not believe she was not a native speaker. Because when you get it early, you can do it. So I'm hoping that we will continue it that way. Thank you for all your work. It's wonderful. We're ready to uh, move on. I think so. uh, then we'll go to Mr. Rogers. Uh, Madam President, Dr. Rogers. <laughs> Let's see if you can sing. Can you sing? Uh, no, but people are welcome. Um, Madam President, Board, Dr. Waddell, um, I'm here to talk about canine detection service, or really better known as drug dogs. Um, in the past, LISD has used drug dogs in our secondary schools. Uh, in the most recent contract, we had 15 visits per year. A visit would uh, consist of one high school visit and two middle schools. So if you look at that model, we were visiting each high school three times in a year. And so uh, this current year, um, student services uh, decided that really the program was ineffective. Uh, cost and so we have not had uh, drug dogs in our secondary schools uh, this current year. Uh, I was asked to revisit that. I looked at the uh, options. Um, you know, a lot of principals are uh, concerned because we have removed the drug testing program and now in conjunction with uh, the removal of drug dogs and so you know, there's a lot of options that we could do, but my recommendation is for us to uh, increase the number of visits to 50 visits, uh, which would mean that every high school would have 10 or 11 visits, every middle school 10 or 11 visits, and the cost would be uh, $18,750. So that's the information I have. Thank you for doing that for doing that research and getting that information because um, I, I had to agree that the random drug testing wasn't necessarily random and I don't think that we were getting the results that we need and removing both of those programs at the same time um, but yeah sent a message and it wasn't a good one um, but I think the drug dogs hold every student accountable and it, it sends the message, do not bring that to our campuses. And it, it doesn't, you know, single out people that are just involved in extracurricular or any one specific student group. I think it holds everybody accountable, and I'm, ex I'm excited. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Just, just a quick question. With the, the high schools, we're going to fewer lockers than that, which... I'm assuming that's where the dogs are taking down the hallway. They're doing the sniffing and actually searching. 
So the obvious question, are we getting the bang for the buck, do you think? And kind of a follow-up without the program, have we seen a rise in drug use? Do we have any way to, of measuring it? Um, Mr. Knapp, first off, you know, a lot of people don't understand that drug docs cannot search individuals. And so, uh, you know, some people think we can have the drug dog at the, the school door and, you know, as students walk by, that's not the case. I mean, drug dogs search lockers, search empty classrooms, uh, and, of course, automobiles, cars parked on, on school property. Um, as far as bang for your buck, that's really hard to determine. The other thing that's hard to measure is the deterrent factor, you know, uh, because students see drug dogs in the hall hallway, you hope that maybe they get the message to leave it at home or not, not bring it at school. And so that's real hard to measure as far as increase. I think the, the point um, was that we had ended both programs at the same time, and it really, uh, in my mind, was um, not the message we probably wanted to send. I think with uh, drug dogs, it's just the fact that it's random. We have an increased number of visits. Students who might want to take that chance just don't know if it's that day. And, uh, and, and, you know, the dogs are amazing. Uh, the fact that uh, Border Patrol agents use them at border stations, if you go there, you see them in the airports, um, I, I think it sends a good message. Well, it's my understanding, Mr. Rogers, even the administrators of that campus do not know when the dogs will be visiting the campus until they actually get there. Um, Mr. Ellington and Mr. Buck have, have been involved with the planning of the schedule, but I believe they notify them either the day right the day before or the day of. When we were using the uh, drug dogs, we notified them the morning of the morning of that day that they'd be visiting them. And uh, if memory serves to address your question about the effectiveness, as uh, memory serves me correctly, the last year that we used them uh, full time, we had two incidents where they actually uh, alerted on a vehicle. So. Uh, all the visits that they had. Next, um, dedication of the fund balance. Dr. Burnett. As you may recall, recall the district uh, has a, uh, employed a new audit firm to, to do the uh, independent uh, financial audit for the uh, uh, fiscal year ending in August. As part of uh, getting ready for that is uh, to, there's some compliance items with uh, the new GASB 54 requirements. The, uh, on May the 16th, the audit committee, Mr. Ferguson, uh, Ms. Gregg, and Mr. Knapp met with our new auditors as well as staff and we discussed this uh, somewhat. We've had some conversations back and forth, and you have a revised uh, uh, draft of a uh, uh, proposed resolution that we are suggesting that you look at in August, and um, uh, hopefully that will reflect uh, the uh, amounts that you've looked at in previous years for the general operating fund. It also recommend it also represents the uh, suggestion of the auditor to. Uh, simply commit 100% uh, of the ending fund balances for the activity funds for those for the use by those uh, respective campuses. Is this different than what was in our packet this draft? S slightly different. I was going to say because I didn't read, I read something else. Our auditors had uh, have suggested to us that we don't need to uh, commit those internal funds such as the right. workers comp funds and they've suggested this uh, uh, this revision to us. Okay, thank you. Just wondered, I know that I had read it. Um, and Chairman, if we just, uh, Dr. Burnett, the, the operative word here is commit, right? That's the new yes, sir. classification that the audit firm wants us to. Uh, That's the new term. We to label the fund these balance. funds as committed. Board members, we had passed this several um, years ago. However, the audit committee recommended that we revisit and just kind of resolve and come up with another to make sure. I assume it's not up for action tonight since... No, in August, he said. Thank you. 